Amen. If you have little kiddos in elementary school, fifth grade and under, we invite you to let them head right out the door, right around the corner there. They're going to work on their Christmas songs for December 17th Christmas service. All right, this morning we're going to be in Exodus chapter 18 as we continue our, oh, they're already done, sweet, even better. We're going to be in Exodus 18 as we continue our look through the book of Exodus as God rescues his people, sets them apart, makes them holy, and gives them his good word. The passage this week really um, resonated with me. It, it, it hit where I've been over the last 12 or so months, where I'm at currently. It was an encouragement at the, at the same time that it's a warning. You know, full-time ministry is not for the faint-hearted. It's not for the weak need. Even part-time ministry is not easy. These are difficult days And there are still difficult days, weeks, months, and years to go. You see, a pastor's work is never done. A shepherd's work is never over. Continues day after day, either until they die or until Jesus comes back. At the beginning of the year, I was feeling that pretty heavy. um, Much like we're going to see here with Moses. But just like Jethro came to Moses with wise counsel to protect him, to protect his sheep, to protect his people. God used my wife and the elders to work to get me some time away on sabbatical this year, which I am grateful for. It was so good for my soul, so good for my ministry. It's been a blessing to my preaching. And so this morning, we're going to look at the advice, the counsel that Jethro gives Moses. And as you hear this, as you see Moses' burden, look inside as well of what God's doing in you. And I want you to be thinking as we go through this passage, how do I give and receive counsel? Do I do it well? Do I do it fleshly? And this passage probably has three sermons in it, but we're, we're really just going to focus on Jethro and Moses here as they reunite at Mount Sinai. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus 18, starting in verse 1. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. And now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons, The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons with her, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people came, come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. 
and I make them known the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what, are you, what you are doing is, is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing that is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them known the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men who, from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace." So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the chiefs of the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. We pray with me. Heavenly Father, let us see a little glimpse into our own hearts, into our own souls this morning. Help us, Lord, to see our pride. Help us to see what humility looks like. God, help us to walk in a way that is honoring to you, in a way that magnifies the name of Jesus. And Lord, let us represent you well. Speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you haven't studied your biblical genealogies lately, you probably should, but it might have slipped right past you how crazy this chapter actually is, how it would have sounded to the Hebrew people when they heard it, when they read through it, after they settled in the promised land. Okay, so we got Jethro. If you didn't get it already, he's Moses' father-in-law. They reiterate that time after time after time that you get it through our thick skulls, right? He's the father of Zipporah. He's described here as a priest of Midian. So in a sense, he is a Midianite. Now that might not mean anything to us today, but it means a lot to the Israelites, You see, the Midianites were descendants of Abraham through his, uh, through Keturah and her son Midian. And Genesis chapter 25, verse 6 says that they settled east in the land of the east, which is what we would say is modern day Saudi Arabia, along the eastern shore of the Gulf of Aqaba. It was a group of Midianites who sold Joseph into slavery when his brothers sold him in Genesis chapter 37. In Numbers 22 through 31, it was the Midianites who joined with the Moabites to use Balaam to curse all of Israel. Balaam, the prophet whose donkey spoke to him and called him out. It was a Midianite woman who was involved in the fall of Israel into idolatry and sexual sin in Numbers chapter 25. And during the time of the judges, the Midianites invaded Israel and oppressed the Israelites until God finally raised up the mightiest warrior, little lowly Gideon, in Judges 6 and 7. So for a Midianite to walk into Israel's camp and offer wise counsel to Moses, the prophet of Yahweh, the one who divided the Red Sea, brought forth quail and manna through the hand of God and humbled mighty Pharaoh. Wow. You sure you picked the right person, God? But what's even crazier is that Moses listens and he accepts it and he does it. You see, it's from an unlikely place that God brings this wise counsel at the foot of Mount Sinai 
through a Midianite. Completely outside of the box thinking by God. This is almost the same connotation as if you know your, your New Testament, your gospel stories, when, when the disciple Nathan is told about Jesus, he's like, can anything good come from Nazareth? The same idea. Can anything good come from Midian? But look at verses 8 through 12 here. Jethro comes into camp. He and Moses, they, they exchange pleasantries, and they go into the tent. Look at verse 8. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. Verse 9, and Jethro did what? He rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel. Moses tells him, here's what God did. Here's what God's been doing. Here's how God's been working in the people. Here's how God's been working in me. And Jethro hears it and he's like, wow, that's awesome. Your God's amazing. Look at verse 11 now. Jethro says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. And he brings a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. Now, biblical scholars, well, well, they'll literally argue about anything, but they argue here about whether or not Jethro was a true follower of Yahweh prior to this moment. Now, we're told he was a priest of Midian, which doesn't necessarily mean that he's a follower of Yahweh. Doesn't mean that he followed Abraham's God, per se, because that word can mean a true priest or a false priest, either way. My guess would be is that he likely knew the things that his great-great-great-great-grandfather Abraham had a God that he followed, that brought him out of Ur. He would have known some of the family history. But it seems that in verse 11 is Jethro's salvation declaration. Now I know that this is God. Before I had heard, but now I know. Now I see it. It's finally clicked. The light has finally been turned on in Jethro's spiritual heart. The veil has been lifted, and now he sees that Yahweh is not simply one God among many. It's not just one path up the tree we could choose to climb it. One of many religious ways to get to God. He is the one and only true God, the great I am, the one and the only, the sovereign. And he rejoices. He's like, this is awesome. This truly is good news. And the salvation of this Midianite man, it's a picture. It's a foretelling of what would happen, what God had already promised to Abraham, that through him, all of the nations would be blessed. It's a picture of the future salvation of people from from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation, worshiping before the throne of God in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, singing the song of salvation in Revelation 7, verse 9. You see, even before Mount Sinai, before the Mosaic law, before we have the Ten Commandments, what do we have? We have the truth that salvation is for all who will believe, all who will come to the Lord in faith. Any who will bow before Him in worship is welcome. Before Mount Sinai, we have the truth that salvation is not only for the Jews. It's available to all and any peoples who will come to the one true God through faith. And how does he come to know this truth of the gospel? Look at verse 8. How does he come to know it? Because Moses told him. Moses told him what the Lord had done. He told him his own personal testimony of the Lord's work in his life and in the lives of the Israelites. He preached. He didn't stay quiet. He couldn't stay quiet. Can you imagine walking through the Red Sea? Can you imagine waking up every morning and seeing the manna like frost on the ground, tasting like sweet honey wafers in your mouth, watching the quail come in exhausted and you eat to the full? Can you imagine seeing the plagues of Egypt 
As God says, yes, this will happen to the Egyptians, but not to the Israelites. And then being like, yeah, I don't think anybody needs to really hear about it. (laughs) You would have to tell people. That's exactly what Moses does. He preaches. But notice this. He doesn't just say the positive parts. He tells him of the hardships. He's like, Jethro, man, this has not been easy. These people are stubborn. It's been hard. We walked three days into a scalding hot desert and still didn't find any water. And then when we did, it was brackish water. We couldn't even drink it. It was bitter. But guess what God did? He's like, Jethro, man, we left from this beautiful place. Elam is a, it was a paradise in the middle of the desert. And then we keep walking. Guess what? No more water again. We're, we're thirsty. We're dragging. It's been hard, Jethro. He tells of the struggles. He tells of the sins of the people. They rebelled. They pushed back. They complained. But you see, the focal point here is not on how good Or how worthy Israel is. The focal point is on how good and faithful God is. The focal point is on what God had done for them. It's about how awesome God is. About how amazing His grace is for sinners like you and for me. That's the gospel that we preach. Yeah, we talk about how good God is. We talk about all the things He's doing. But it doesn't mean we sugarcoat our own shortcomings because that's what truly preaches the gospel because if it's just because well if i just did everything right and i did everything perfect and i always said the right things and i was just smart enough to figure out that god was the only one and if you would just be as smart as me or as good as me or as righteous as me then you too could be welcomed in that's not the gospel that's not good news for any of us The good news is the fact that even though we are rebellious sinners, unworthy of God's attention at all, God still comes and dwells with his people and calls us to himself and saves us through the blood of his son. That's the good news. And that's exactly what Jethro hears. He hears how awesome God is. Verse 9, he rejoices for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel. He does not say, wow, Israel is awesome. Woo! Yes! Go Hebrews! He says, wow, God is awesome. Look at what Yahweh did. It was God's story. It all pointed to God's glory. And the same is true for each and every single one of our salvation stories today. If you start your answer to the question, how did you get saved? If you start the answer to that question with I, you're wrong. You don't see your salvation story correctly or you're not saved. The question always, or the answer always gets started with he, man, he, he did it. Because it wasn't about you. It's about God and what God did for you and what God did in you. I didn't do anything. The only thing I brought to my salvation story is the sin that demanded Jesus' sacrifice in the first place. I had just as much to do with my second birth, my spiritual birth, as I did with my first. I was just there. Showed up for the party. And now I get presents every year on the same day. (laughs) That's what it's like with our spiritual journey. God's like, I'm going to draw you in. Watch this. You don't like me right now. You don't want anything to do with me. You want to live for you, yourself, and you. But guess what? Watch this. I'm going to start changing your heart. I'm going to start tweaking it. I'm going to start moving in it. And all of a sudden, you're like, man, I didn't used to like these things, but now like, I love to sing with the people. Man, I, didn't, I, didn't, I hated reading. Now I can't get enough of God's word in my mouth and my ears and my eyes. Man, I used to love doing these things, but man, I don't even want to be around that anymore. 
I don't want anything to do with that sin. As God is the one who brings you to salvation. It's not about how I found my way back home to God. It's about how he sought me out and rescued me by drawing me to himself. And Jethro's conversion, you see what it results in, verse 12? It results in God-centered worship. He rejoices. He says, blessed be the Lord. Verse 12, he brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron and the elders of Israel all come around. And what do they do? They fellowship. They eat bread together. They have a potluck. It's biblical. (laughs) But look who they do it in front of. Aaron and Moses and Jethro and all the elders of Israel eat bread with Jethro before God. That's huge. You see, Jethro worships the Lord, and due to his union with God now, he is now welcomed into the people of God. Do you see that? They fellowship together. He's included in the community with the leaders of Israel before God himself. He's included. New Testament phrase, he's grafted into the tree. All because of his faith in Yahweh. This is the exact same thing that Paul brings up when he talks about the salvation of the Gentiles through faith in Christ. We're grafted into the tree of Israel. We weren't originally a part of it. We were not originally a part of all those promises. And God says, guess what? I know it, but I'm going to bring you in anyway. I'm going to slice you and cut you and nick a little piece here and then shove you into the tree and then wrap you up. Make sure you grow into that same tree. There's one tree, not two. And the blessing of this is branches that used to not be a part of the family of God are now called part of the family of God now made one through the work of Christ on the cross. One saved people of God. It's not Hebrew believers and Gentile believers. There are only believers. That's unreal. Paul calls it a mystery. He's like, this is unfathomable. This is crazy talk. But he says, Christ has broken down the dividing walls of hostilities, making both groups into one. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. It's a beautiful thing. We're co-heirs with Christ, joined together. And because you're united to Christ, you're united to God in his family. And Jethro points to that reality, future reality, really, here in Exodus chapter 18. So now you have Jethro. At least at this point, he's definitely, he's a true believer in Yahweh. He hangs around camp for a few days, and guess what? This is an old, wise man. He's been around the block a few times. He's got a ton of daughters, so he's obviously really smart. (laughs) Or lives in a different house. He's watching his son-in-law minister to all of these people, and he sees something that concerns him. He's got this like divine warning light that goes off in his mind. And he shows a humility, and he shows, uh, takes a perfect approach to addressing the issue that he sees here. Look at verse 14. He sees all that Moses was doing. So he's watching. He's sitting back. He's just observing. He's attentive. He's paying attention. And he sees something. He doesn't necessarily think is good, but he doesn't jump to a conclusion here. He asks Moses to explain, okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing something. Will you explain this to me? Is what I'm seeing accurate? He's like, what is this you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning to evening? Like, what's happening here? Explain to me what your thought process is. Why are you doing this? You see, he gets his facts straight before he jumps to a conclusion. He wants to make sure his analysis is accurate before he opens his mouth or suggests or change suggests changes or improvements or or warnings. Whew, that one hit. 
Do we do that when we offer up our own counsel? Or our own critiques? Or our own thoughts? Do we do that before we send the email? Or the text message? Are we quick to listen, slow to speak? We can learn a lot from Jethro. Like this dude's been a believer literally 24 hours. And he's like, "Ah, I want to get my facts straight before I call out the prophet of God. Moses then replies that he does two things. He judges between any disputes amongst the people and he teaches the statutes of God and his laws. And look at verses 17 through 23 here. This is Jethro's response. His reply of advice says, dude, I love you. What you're doing isn't good. This ain't the way to go about it. You're going to burn yourself out. And you're not only going to burn out yourself, you're going to burn out the people. This is not good for you and it's not good for the flock. In a sense, he tells Moses, guess what, dude? Ministry is not a one-man show. It can't be. You can't do this all by yourself. It's too heavy for you to carry on your own. You need help. Jethro saw the danger inherent with the way that Moses was doing ministry. Remember, we're not talking about 50 people. We're not talking about 100,000 people. We're probably talking between two to four million people, including kids, that needed ministered to. You're talking about the entire state of Iowa with one pastor, one counselor, one judge, and that's all the same dude. If Moses kept this up, there was no way he could maintain the pace that he was going at. It wasn't going to end well. Sun up to sundown, case after case after case, people just continued to bring things before him, one after another. And it wasn't just the little things. It wasn't like, well, what color should I paint my house? It wasn't, what shoes should I wear today? It wasn't, well, my wife said something mean to me. These were burdens that come with the reality of sinners living together. And you can imagine how fun it is for a family of sinners to live together in one house. Imagine two to four million sinners all living together in a really tight place and you don't have a house. You're just sleeping on the ground in tents and and you're continually moving. And you don't even have, you know, water sometimes and, and your food is always the same. Dad, could you imagine the complaints? Like take a car ride with kids with a stock full fridge in the back seat and plenty of food to feed an army for a month, and still they can't find anything that they want to eat on the way there. And then they got to go to the bathroom. And then it's too bumpy, and then it's too hot, or then it's too cold, or then it's I can't breathe. Then it's my brother or sister's punching me. Do you imagine two to four million people? Whew. It was simply too much for one man. And so what's Jethro do? He tells Moses to go find men who can share the load with him. But not just any man's going to do here. He gives him four things to look for. He says, find men who are capable, able to do the job well. They have to be capable men. Because if they're not capable, now you're just empowering the wrong guys. But they also had to be spiritual men who feared God. Men who cared more about honoring the Lord than they did about honoring men around them. Who cared more about what God thought than what the people thought. Men who would be willing to do the right thing no matter what. Men of integrity who were trustworthy and loyal to God's truth would not waver away from what God said is right. Men that the people knew would do the right thing. And finally, they had to be men who were incorruptible, who were unwilling to take a bribe, who were unwilling to be swayed away from the righteousness of God. That's who uh, Jethro told Moses to pursue. 
Go amongst the people, all the people. Not just one tribe, not just this clan over here. Go amongst all the people and seek out men who fit these characteristics. And what these men would allow Moses to do is exactly what God had called him to do. Verses 19 and 20. He would still represent the people before God. He would still bring the big cases before the Lord. He would still teach the people about the statutes and the laws of God, as well as how to walk with the Lord day after day. His role as prophet would not change. You see, Moses' mission was noble, his mission wasn't the problem. His mission was given to him by the Lord. It was divinely appointed. You see, the problem wasn't with his mission. It was with his method. There was a flaw in his method. His method was simply ineffective. It wasn't going to lead to what he thought it would. It was going to lead to burnout. Not only for him, but for the people. Could you imagine being one of the people of Israel at this time? You have an issue a serious issue, and you're like, I want to be faithful to God. I want to know what God wants me to do here. So I'm going to go to Moses. And you wake up, six or seven o'clock in the morning. It's early. You're like, hey, early bird gets the worm. All right, let's go. You show up, and you get there, and the line is already 10,000 people long. It's like going to Lynch, quick lube, and you pull up, and the line's already out on the old 30. You're like, are you kidding me? At one day, and everybody else did too. That's what's happening. Could you imagine the frustration as you're like, all I need to do is talk. To, it's going to take me 30 seconds to talk to Moses. He talks to God. He talks down. And now I'm done. Like, let's go. One minute. Give me 60 seconds. Man, it would be brutally difficult for the people. You see, Moses' heart was in the right place. He truly cared for the people. Like, he loves them. He lays down his life for them. He wanted to help as many as he could with whatever time God gave him to do it, but it simply just was not effective. Because one man can only do so much. He's limited by space and time. He can only be in one place at a time, and he only gets 24 hours in a day to do so. And so Jethro says, hey, you need to divide and conquer. Beth's method to, to minister to as many people as possible was to spread the work amongst other leaders so Moses could focus on the work from the top down. Share the load. That was the goal, not take away Moses' leadership. And the same idea was applied to the early church in Acts chapter 6 when the apostles are like, dude, there's so much going on and we're trying to we're preach and we're trying to evangelize and disciple the people and we're trying to work in sanctification and, and yet the, the, the widows over here are not being cared to as well as we would like them to and the tables aren't being served properly and like, man, what are we doing? And they chose seven men to be deacons who served the widows during the daily distributions of food. They functioned in much the same way as these leaders in Exodus so that the elders, the pastors, the apostles in this case, could focus on the preaching of the word similarly to Moses in Exodus 18. And we function very similarly here at CBC with elders focused on the preaching and teaching and shepherding of the body and having deacons who serve in various areas and ministries as the church has need as the hands and feet even of the elders so that we can focus on the preaching and teaching and shepherding. Comes straight out of Exodus 18, Acts chapter 6. Today, this might not seem like such an otherworldly, divinely inspired counsel piece of advice. Like, pfft, everybody knows divide and conquer. Everybody knows many hands make light work. What's, what's the big deal? Well, here's what I see as the biggest deal here. You see the way Moses responds to Jethro's correction. Moses shows his true humility here. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3 says that Moses was meeker than all the people on the face of the entire earth. And you see it plain as day right here in his response to his father-in-law. Verse 24, so Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. That one sentence, 
That is not a normal response. How do you respond when someone calls out your mistakes? How do you respond when someone calls out your shortcomings? Critiques you. Even if it's justified, we normally don't respond great. No one likes to have their weaknesses or mistakes called out. Nobody enjoys it. Try going to someone's home project they just finished. They're proud of it. You go, yeah, you missed a spot. Woo, you might get kicked out the front door. Or someone bakes you this wonderful five-course meal, and you're like, ah, it needed more seasoning. Woo. You don't do that, right? Nobody, nobody likes to have mistakes, weaknesses, shortcomings called out. None of us enjoys being corrected or told that we're doing something wrong. Doubt it, just have children. And especially nobody likes being called out by their in-laws. <sighs> Yikes. Yikes. But those closest to us, those that are around us the most often, are the very ones we tend to lash out against even when their observations are legitimate and accurate. Even when we know they're right, probably especially when we know they're right. But Moses humbly listens, he humbly acquiesces, he humbly applies it. He weighs what Jethro says. In verse 24, he does what he said to do. He implements it. He puts it into practice. And it blesses both him and the people. It was good advice. It was good counsel. And so I want to leave you this morning with this question. Same one I gave you this at the very beginning. Do I give and receive counsel in God-honoring ways? When I receive criticisms, when I receive advice, suggestions, do I receive it humbly like Moses or do I get angry? Do I heed it or do I just throw it aside and ignore it? Say, I'm never going to do that. James chapter 1, 19 and 20 we quoted before, it says, be quick to hear, slow to speak. But listen what it also says, be slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You see, anger pushes back quickly. Anger gets self-defensive. Anger says, who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to say you know what's best? Who are you to tell me anything? But humility listens Humility takes the time to listen to the truthfulness and legitimacy of the counsel or the criticism. And humility is willing to say, I could be wrong, let me listen. Humility says, there could be a better way, let me listen. James chapter 3, verse 17 says, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. That open to reason literally means persuadable. Meaning you're willing to listen and you're willing to be persuaded differently. You're willing to change if you're wrong. That's wisdom. Not I know better so I don't listen to anyone. Being willing to have your opinion changed by wise counselors. Being, being able to see things from a different perspective than what you currently do. It's a willingness to be corrected. And you know, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, talks about all Scripture is God-breathed. And it gives four things that Scripture is useful for. For teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Do you recognize three of those things are fixing my mistakes? Teaching's the initial. I didn't know, so you taught me. Rebuking is saying, hey, you're walking the wrong direction. You're not doing it correctly. You're making a mistake and it's stopping me where I'm at. Correcting is to get me from the mistake to the right path. And then training in righteousness is moving me along that path in a godly way, in a righteous manner. So the question each of us has to ask is, do I allow godly men and women to speak scripture into my life to teach me the truth, rebuke me when I'm not walking in it, correct me to get me back on the path, and train me up in righteous living day after day after day? If the answer is no then you need to read your Bible. You need to come talk to me. Talk, talk, probably talk to Dennis. It'd be better. 
talk to Stephen. Because that's what it looks like to walk with Jesus, is to allow godly men and women to speak truth into my life and for me to say, okay, I know I'm a sinner at heart. I know I don't have it all put together. I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to be corrected. We don't like it. It's not fun. But Jesus didn't say this life would be easy, did he? He actually said the opposite. This would be difficult. And the thing is, regardless of whether it's good counsel or bad counsel, we can respond in a God-honoring way. We hold firmly to the truth of God. We season it or we, we, we look at it through a magnifying glass of God's word. Does it speak truth according to God's word? And if it's bad counsel, we still look at it. Is this through God's, the lens of God's scripture or is it through the lens of their flesh? If it's through the lens of the flesh, then we seek to reconcile with our brother or sister in Christ. We don't follow bad counsel but we do know that we have to test it by God's word, not simply through our preferences or our thoughts or traditions. First Thess 5, 21, test everything, hold fast to what is good. That's what we do. And in the end, we follow Jesus' path, whether it is true or false, good or bad counsel. Jesus is... 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. So in the end, we trust the Lord and we say, God, I believe that you are faithful. I believe that you are trustworthy to do what is good and what is just and what is right. You have the final word. And so I'm going to hold fast to you. I'm going to hold on to you and trust that you have my best intentions at heart. And in Christ, we know there's therefore no longer any condemnation for us who believe None of us is without sin. So we're probably justified in some of the criticisms we receive. But in Christ, there is grace and abundance. There is enough to cover all of our sins, all of our mistakes, all of our shortcomings, all of our weaknesses. And it keeps us from sinking into despair. It keeps us encouraged to keep moving on, to know that God is working all things for our good and for his glory. And just like Moses responds with humility, we too can respond with humility and bring God glory when we're corrected, when we're rebuked, when we're trained, and even when we're brought up on the good side, on the right side. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, you amaze us that you've welcomed us, a foreign people, into your family. That you've invited us to be your sons and your daughters, and you've blessed us with all of the spiritual things in the heavenly places through Christ. Father, help us to now walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling that we've received, in a manner that brings you glory, in a manner that's humble like our Savior was humble, silent before his shears. And God, we want to make sure that as we listen to counsel, that we gauge it through the lens of Scripture and that we apply what is good, throw out what is bad, but in every case, we bring you honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All his promises are yes and amen. Yes, yes, yes. Woo, that's good news, isn't it? Yes. Oh, amen. <laughs> like to encourage you, stick around if you have any connection with Animosa or like to hear more uh, out here in the foyer by the chairs. If we get too many, we'll just go into room two. Remember, first word in our church name, community. One of the founding things of this church is engaging in the community where we're at. And right now, there's not much able to be engaged in in Anamosa, church-wise, biblical preaching. It's super exciting to see God working in a way that we've been praying for as a leadership team for years and years and years that God would continue to expand out into the neighboring towns. It's amazing to see God do that. We want to be a church that's engaged in our community. We want churches engaged in the community of Animosa as well. So stick around. Be a part of that. Um, if you haven't brought your shoe boxes in, make sure you do that before Tuesday morning. So do it tomorrow. But church, nothing about us. It's all about God. If we have anything but humility, we're in the wrong place. We're in the wrong mindset. We're in the wrong heart. Because it wasn't because of us, anything we did, that God saved us. It was all because of him and his grace and his mercy. And so when we get counsel, when we get critiques, when we get advice, when we get 
uh, correction, the only way we can honestly receive it is humbly take it before the Lord and allow him to say, yes, no, maybe so. But as a church, that's what we do. We build each other up, we help each other along, and we help each other walk with Jesus. Go church, go and be blessed.